Well, it's uh, it's a privilege to have you uh, with me, Professor K. I, I greatly appreciate it. Really looking forward to it. Uh, in the keto and carnivore community, you you won't need much introduction. But for those that are not familiar with uh, with you, could you just give us a quick background of your professional and uh, academic experience, those types of things? Yeah. Um, first of all, thanks for having me. It's a privilege to be here. Um, basically, my background is 25 years or so in academia, researching, publishing, teaching to um, both undergraduate and postgraduate students. Um, in really three interlinked but separate fields academically, I moved around within my career path a bit. I started out as an exercise physiologist. After that, I moved to human nutrition for a few years. And then when I kind of had my fill of that, I then went on to cardiovascular pathophysiology. So heart disease, atherosclerosis, what causes that, what doesn't cause that. So that's kind of truncating 26 years of academic practice down to its lowest common denominator, basically. But that's about it. Um, been involved in the science as a publishing research scientist, been involved on the other side of the desk as a peer reviewer, um, been, been as, up to the highest ranks, I guess, of senior academics, did that. And now I'm doing something different. Uh, I had I had a skin full of that a few years ago and went, mm, you know what, I'm going to go and do my own thing instead now. So I've been doing that ever since. So there you go. There it is. Yeah. Uh, and actually, I'm glad that you're doing something different or else uh, a lot of us would have never, uh, never got to experience that. So uh, and also you have done kind of a ketogenic way of eating for 27 or so years. Is that yeah, give right? take. yeah, it's about right. Yep. Uh, and, and pretty strict. Uh, I think I've heard you mention about 95% pretty strict carnivore for about seven, eight years. Is that? A... Yeah, the more the, the stricter end is more in recent years. Um, I have been absolutely perfect for short periods for challenges and series of videos that we're making and whatever yep. else. Um, and I definitely do get a benefit, I think, over and above the 95% level. But the level that sits comfortably with me, with my personality, with my lifestyle, et cetera, is around about 95%, which doesn't kind of mean daily. It means maybe on five days out of 100, the, the discipline goes out the window and hedonism rules the day, shall we say. Okay. Uh, less and less, because the more, the longer you go down this path, the more violently the body seems to um, respond to any transgressions. Yeah. But yeah, yeah well, you know, relatively strict across time on average, yes. All right. I, I actually, I'd heard you mention one time that you did notice a big difference. So I, I've, I've not been doing this nearly as long as you and, and not as strict as, as you either, probably, uh, although predominantly car carnivore for a while. I am currently actually doing a challenge. And I would heard you mention that going from like 90 percent to just, you know, super strict for 30, 60, 90 days, you really notice not just a 10 percent increase, but a dramatic, yeah. a dramatic increase. Is that yes. right? Yes. OK. Yeah. So. I, I want to start with uh, just an extremely fundamental question because I think, or I should say foundational question is really what I meant. Because I think if you're going to talk about human nutrition, it's really the uh, the bedrock to build on. Uh, mm -hmm. How many carbohydrates do humans actually need in a dietary mm -hmm. fashion? Right. So the exact dietary requirement for carbohydrates in human beings is not one single gram ever. So, and obviously that's optimal, right? That's, but, well, but I don't, I don't live there and, yeah. and you don't either, right? <laughs> but it is well, ideal. Yeah. yeah. On, so, on 95 yeah. days and 100, there's no sugar going in. Right. Yeah. So what, now, 
when you do when you do really strict, which I've cut cream and uh, heavy whipping cream and cheese mm. and dairy out of my diet for, yeah. for right now, but normally I add that in. Mm. So that is still a, a carbohydrate, right? Sorry, which, still count that? which is still I mean, kind of I, I'm still getting some carbohydrates from heavy whipping cream, for example. Oh, very little, but there will be some in there. Sure. Right. Yeah. So, so sure. when we do, if we look at really zero or near to zero as possible as being the best, let's just say mm -hmm. we'll use that term. Mm -hmm. At some point, as we add some carbohydrate, uh, carbohydrates back in, you know, I would guess that the uh, negative impact doesn't track directly with the line of increase. At some point, it just exponentially rises uh, in in really negative impact and harm to the body. It would seem so, yeah. I mean, it's uh, any amount of carbohydrate taken in above the need. Is, which is zero. Which is zero. But what I mean by need in this context is the body will have a set point for how much glucose is in the blood. And it wants that much glucose in, in, it, in itself, in its blood. If you eat an amount of carbohydrate purely to subserve that, then it will probably do that. And there won't be a problem. But as soon as you go that one gram over, two grams over, five, 10, 50, 100 grams over per day, whatever that excess amount is above what is needed, is going to pull in the blood at right. least for a time for some time right yeah. and that's going to cause problems so on occasion some moderate amount some blueberries it, it, we do something to us mm. but it's it's not it's not catastrophic but it, it's it's right. not ideal right right yeah <clears throat> excuse me so um Obviously, if carbs aren't on the menu, uh, so what really is appropriate? What is the ideal menu mm. for food for humans? Right. So the standpoint from which I base the answer to that question is from a standpoint of having to put together several disparate areas of hard science and retrofit those in a way to make the argument which you'll understand when i've made it the sad fact that we all need to accept is that there is no nutrition science to be had this whole area in the science literature that you'll see ring fenced area that's called human nutrition science it, it, it's it's a have it's a fallacy none of that is science Science is experimental, it's controlled, it's disciplined in its approach to establishing causes versus effects. Everything else is observations under more or less discipline. So a lot of people say there's no evidence in support of the argument here as a definite cause and effect thing, which I have to say, sure, there isn't but there's no antithetical evidence either. And the human nutrition science, I know I worked in the field myself as a publishing author for a number of years. It's not science in there, boys and girls, okay? I could tell you stories that would make your hair curl or whatever. Anywho, so that's that's how that pans out. It's, it's, an, it's, it's an area of pseudoscience dressed up to look like science, to make some people feel like they're scientists and to justify some careers and some salaries and, and that kind of stuff. Very little experimental work of any kind going on in there under any sort of control or discipline or whatever else. So, steer me back to the original question and I'll answer it for you in a more shorter fashion. Yeah, so the original question was, what is the actual uh, appropriate diet for humans? That's right. Okay, so that was the wording. Okay, so my position statement on that, on the basis that there is no science, comes from looking at things like stable isotope testing, which is hard science. 
scientists go out into the field, they find human skeletal remains of tens and hundreds of thousands of years of age sometimes. They bring it back to the lab and they analyse the balance of nitrogen in those long bones in the collagen which can still be found in long bones after a very very you know, huge number of years and they look for the nitrogen isotope balance and that tells them exactly what the balance of that individual person's diet was in terms of plant-based food so-called and animal-based food hard science it tells us what trophic level human beings have existed at throughout our 350,000 year existence on the planet as Homo sapiens sapiens. Our diet was actually very, very similar before that too, for four and a half million years. But let's just stick with this species. It's supposed to have delineated to have began 350,000 years ago, the first truly human person. Okay, good. Anyway, the diet was obligate hypercarnivore. In other words, the vast majority of food was in the form of the flesh and fat of animals. Very little plant material of any kind was going in. Almost nothing containing significant amounts of starch or available carbohydrate anyway, actually. Nothing like today. Nothing like what, the, the, I mean, the, the, the stuff that you go down to the green, green grocer and buy today, the humans, early humans weren't running around seeing those things growing. They're human inventions, those things. They did not exist. Humans were scrabbling around with sticks in the dirt, digging up rooty, um, not even tubers. I mean, they're, they're, they're calling them tubers, but they're nothing like potatoes, sweet potatoes, those kind of things that you'd see today. These were long, thin, fibrous, tasteless, almost devoid of nutrition things and what humans were doing was boiling these things up over hours and hours and hours to loosen up the fiber to, even to any extent swallowing that and allowing the very small amount of fermentative bacteria that humans are able to host to do what they can to release just a little bit of short chain fatty acid as a result of that fermentation um, so that was very much a secondary subsistence methodology and then a couple of weeks a year there were some berries to be had or some you know so, so fruit. 80 percent basically of uh their diet would have been fatty meat yep okay so and the other 20 percent in terms of this fibrous gruelly stuff they were eating um that was all metabolized directly to short chain fatty acid so the intakes macronutrient wise in effect in humans were proteins and fats period. right yeah virtually no carbohydrates Correct. from what they were what they were getting so yeah. I, I i think i i'm sure i've heard you mention that predominantly large rudiment animals would have been mm. uh, would have been the menu of the day so yeah. i i wanted to ask you about is there uh, is there any significant reason the difference between what would be for us in the U.S., the beef or maybe bison versus small rudiment animals. So goats, sheep, uh, mm -hmm. deer, stuff like that. Is it a, yeah. a fat ratio in there? Or, or yeah, there yeah. There, there's a particular fatty acid profile and ratio that seems to be optimal for human nutritive purpose that seems to be associated with the ruminant animals at the larger end, cows. Right. Let's name them the cows. That's what they yes. are. Basically. And, you know, very closely related animals. Right. So other animals, go ahead. I just say other animals have slightly different fatty acid profiles. I don't see that necessarily as problematic. And there are people who base their diets around other animals than beef. Um, I, I don't see that as necessarily a problem. But rudiments would be better than like pork or pigs or, or chickens or, and those types of things. So I, yeah. I guess, so are those, I mean, we predominantly beef, eggs, we bacon, mm. but we mm. still mix in 
some other meats as well. Sure. So, yeah. so I guess as long as um, it's probably not maybe optimal, but not not that bad. The intakes here in this house are about eighty percent beef, and about twenty percent everything else: lamb, pork, chicken, fish, and other seafoods, etc. That works well for us. It seems to anyway. Um, it's my thinking is it's probably close to what humans were doing at large post agrarian sort of thing obviously a bit different but um, when we were hunting down large ruminant animals on the plains that was that was happening without there being any adding of carbohydrate into the diet as well um, yeah they wouldn't have passed on uh, they wouldn't have passed on what they came across if it was uh, if they found some eggs or they uh, sure found the chicken right i mean sure. they're not going to pass up on it i mean there's the, there is that theory that's quite a good one that suggests that humans early humans at least were largely scavengers more than they were predators before they really honed their predatory skills and and all of that it's one of the reasons why it's thought that our stomach acidity acidity is um so extreme because often we were coming across um well and truly high meat stuff that had maybe been lying around for some time or or that was stuff that was left behind by other animals or whatever right so can uh and then another question that there's pushback, um, you know, against the carnivore or, or even super strict keto, I guess. The uh, the issue of getting air, all the nutrients we need from meat. Mm. So we, we really can get everything that we that we need from meat. Do we need anything else as far as supplements, anything like that? There are no nutritional supplements that a person can expect to need as an automatic or fait accompli function of undertaking a carnivorous way of living. I mean, if anybody out there thinks there is any nutrient that's definitely not met to physiological needs on that diet, please let me know about it. 